Good morning. Welcome to Urban Voice Gordons Bay. It's so good to be with you again. My name is Wesley and uh, my wife, Donald and I just spent a week on holiday. We went on the lovely garden route, went to visit some friends in the place called Kerberga. Uh, it's formerly known as Port Elizabeth and then spent some time in Nature's Valley with some very dear friends of ours. Visited my brother in Neisner and then uh, came back home again. It was really good just to be away and just to have some downtime, some R&R, &R, recreation and relaxation. But I'm so glad I'm able to share God's Word with you again this morning. I just want to encourage our church as we also go for uh, do municipal elections tomorrow. Let's just be prayerful and ask God to put the right people in place to stop corruption to ensure that um, our service delivery in our municipalities starts to be way better than what it is. So let's just continue to pray. Pray especially for the areas um, where they really have had bad management and leadership um, and really ask God just to come and bring in His kingdom, the way that His kingdom operates, even in our governments. So let's just pray as we ask God just to come and speak to us. Thank you again, Lord, that we come prepared to hear you speak to us. We're asking that you would open up our hearts, help us to see uh, what you see, open up our eyes to have spiritual eyes. And Lord, I pray that even as we listen this morning, may we recognize the areas that we want you to help us to get stronger in and better in. But ultimately, Lord, we want to live our lives that glorifies your name in our world today. Be with us. Speak to us. To so those who need to hear a special word this morning, I pray that as they listen, the Holy Spirit would speak into their hearts and give them the answers that they need. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, so we're doing a series called Dangerous Church. And it's uh, coming from a verse in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, where Jesus says this to Peter after he says that Jesus is the Christ, he's the son of the living God. And on that confession, Jesus says, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is called to be dangerous to the gates or to hell. A dangerous also means likely to cause problems or to have adverse consequences. And that's what the enemy, the devil and his angels and everything that goes along with that should feel when they see us, the church, which is made up of people coming to share the good news of the gospel. We are to be dangerous to the enemy. Doing church as usual is not going to accomplish the task of reaching the world with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so churches have to be willing to risk it all, to be dangerous to the status quo. And we don't want to be the status quo in our church at Urban Voice Gordons Bay. Because following Jesus was never meant to be safe. Are we safe? Or dangerous. So over the last couple of weeks I've looked at this and um, and I've, I've come to this point of where we need to understand the reasons why we cannot remain safe. And some of the things I'm going to say this morning um, is actually going to be very practical for your life. Why we cannot stay safe. If you stay safe, you don't meet new people. So that's the one I want to bring across this week. You just hang around with your friends, the people that you know, your lifelong friends or people that you have things in common with. You're comfortable with the conversation, just as we had over this past week, my wife and I with our friends. We've known them for over 20 years. Great conversations, but still seeing the same people, the ones that you know are going to be with you, your friends, no matter what. There's nothing wrong. With lasting friendships. But as Christ follows, we are called to broaden our friendship circles. 
So here's the main point. Meeting new people stretches us. It may even help us to gain new interests or maybe change an attitude, our ideals, or maybe challenge our way of thinking when we meet new people who are different to us. But it's one of the main reasons we follow Jesus. He calls us and says we need to go and make disciples of every nation, every tongue, every tribe, every person, no matter what their background is, no matter what language they speak, no matter whether they're rich or if they're poor, we are called to meet new people, make new friendships. You can't say, I love people, but you don't want to meet them. Or we can't just say, ah, uh, I do meet new people, but you know, actually, they're all Christ followers. So there's one thing in common. And we find that even in our church and many churches around, we find that Christians meet other Christians and invite them to come to church, new into the area. And so come and visit our church. Or there's transfer growth. People move from one church to the other church. And we don't see new people coming to know Jesus, just as we spoke about last week in Acts, and many were saved and added. But a dangerous church engages with contemporary society. I think one of the things why we're safe is because we are not willing to have dangerous engagement. And so a dangerous church has dangerous engagements. Our passage of scripture today is out of Acts chapter 17. Uh, Paul and Silas are in Thessalonica. And, and they are accused by the people, by the Jews there, of this. In verse 6 of chapter 17 it says, These men have caused trouble all over the world. They shouted, and now they are disturbing our city too. They were going in and spreading the gospel and that was changing the status quo. And then they moved to um, Berea, Paul, Silas and Timothy. And, and some Jews come and follow them and find that they're there now and start to say exactly some of the same things. And, and then they have to take Paul out of Berea and let's escort him and they take him to Athens. He didn't plan to go there. He's been sent there. To get out of trouble. And so he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him. So let's look at Acts chapter 17 and verse 16 to 23. I'm actually going to read the whole passage so you can get a picture of what's going on. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And when he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? Others said, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. Verse 19. And then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You are saying some rather strange things and we want to know what's it all about. It should be explained that all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. Verse 22. And so Paul, standing in the midst of area. Aeropagus, it's a very difficult word to say, okay, it's also known as Mars Hill, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Paul was deeply troubled. He's wandering around Athens. It's a place of high culture. I've had the opportunity of being there uh, 
uh, going around the city for two days. And you see the history, the uh, ruins, but it, it's a city of great culture, of historical culture, of great intellectual stimulation. That's where all the Greek philosophers came from. But Paul is not impressed with the beauty of the city. He's actually deeply distressed because the city is full of idols. Now we live in Gordon's Bay and Gordon's Bay is breathtakingly beautiful. Some of the sunsets that you see there is amazing. That little bay is absolutely beautiful. Well, if you go further into Cape Town, you can go out of Stellenbosch and see our vineyards. You, we live in the Helderberg Basin. There are some magnificent mountains. I'm going to show some of that on the screen. And then you get Cape Town and Table Mountain. And if you're just flying in or even if you're on the other side, you see this amazing bowl of a city. And it's a magnificent mountain. And we can be caught up with the beauty of the city. But Paul looks at Athens through Christ-influenced eyes. Tony Merida says this, We see the world in the light of God's revelation. As Christ follows, we now have a new worldview. We view the world in the light of four things. The creation, the fall, Christ's redemption, and the new creation. If you think about your city, if you think about where you live, you may not be living in our part of the world. You may be, you know, I know some guys are watching in Chicago and some in Germany and some in the UK, um, you, or in Johannesburg even. You may be looking at your own city. What distresses you about your city? What distresses us in the world? If you're a Christ follower, you're just distressed because it's now a bit more difficult to become a Christian because Christianity is not the central thing in our society and in our culture any longer. You think it wouldn't be nice if everybody believed what I believed and didn't challenge my views? Well, that's the wrong kind of distress. You're more worried about yourself than you're worried about others. Paul is distressed, but not only is he distressed? He does something about it. Paul engaged with the people. If you look at verse 23, it says this, For as I walked and looked carefully at your objects of worship, Paul looked carefully. He examined the idols. He, he, he doesn't show just casual indifference. He wants to know what is all this about. He's provoked. Not only is he provoked, but there's a godly Passion and compassion that rises up in him. There's a bit of righteous indignation as well because he wants to push back the gates of hell. And like Paul, we too have to examine the idols of our time. We need to examine it because you know what? We may actually be partaking in that kind of worship unknowingly. We need to dig deeper and find out what are the underlying issues, the underlying desires that this idol worship represents. Mark Driscoll said this, if you want to change the culture, you've got to get into the culture. Now, he, he means we need to understand it and engage with it. It doesn't mean to say we must adopt it. We must just be part of it and just accept it all. So I want to highlight three idols um, that I've recognized in our world. First is the idol of consumerism. We look at our malls and even during this lockdown period, there's been, you can shop online. It's, it's all about um, the choices that I have and I, that I can make. Uh, I was amazed when we lived in the UK for a while and we went to the shop and, and I, I wanted to buy baked beans. There was a whole aisle just of baked beans. I had so many baked beans to choose from. <laughs> Which is the best one? When we went for rice, we weren't sure what kind of rice to use. There was American long grain and there was this parboiled and basmati. We wasn't sure what rice to use. So much to choose from. I 
And we even see it in our church among Christians, or rather Christians and their understanding of church. Um, I want to go to a church where I like the style of music, or that I like the preaching. Plus, you know, that's the good kind of preaching that I enjoy. Oh, I want to, you know, you know, the building must be comfortable for me and the parking must be great. And the people, oh, I must like the people. They must be like me and, and, and we must have a lot of things in common. I'm looking for a church where I can feel at home because everything I like will be there. It's all about me consuming. John McClure, writing about this, says, The idolatry of consumerism could indicate a deep desire for future fulfillment. Consumers are always pursuing the next best thing. What are you pursuing this morning? Are you pursuing God? In what sense does God and, and Jesus Christ meet your deepest desires? Does He fulfill your needs? Does he make you whole? If not, you will be seeking other things that you can consume to fulfill you. Christ has come to give you life in all its fullness. The second idol I want to talk about is the idol of acceptance. There's a, something in each and every one of us where you have a desire to be loved. To be accepted. And it's so strong that we will go along with the crowd, even though we know that what the crowd is doing isn't right. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, Paul is preaching. If you read further down, he says, In him, God, we live and move and have our being. And often we try to find our place or we try to find meaning in other things than God. And while they may be good things, it still falls short. And sooner or later, we're going to discover, no, it's, I've lost, it's not fulfilling me any longer. And so you can look for something else. God alone created not only us, but he created all things. He alone knows our worth. He, knowing God, it's God that we live and move and have our being. Man, it gives me just a sense of peace in the chaotic world in which I live. And so as we let go of these idols that we chase, we begin to see our deepest desires being fulfilled by God. The third idol I want to talk about is the idol of personal experience. We build altars of superlative experience. Let me explain. It's seeking the highest high, the best car, the most extreme sport, the most sordid confession in a reality show, the biggest shock factor, the most tattoos I can have. And we, we, ha we, we even worship this experience idol in our churches. You know, I, I need to feel it when I come on a Sunday morning. You know, I, I want to make sure that I, they can cultivate a mountaintop experience for me during the time of worship. I must be able to sense that I'm in that space. And so we try all sorts of things to try and create it. You know, the smoke machine and the music must get me emotionally connected to God. And if I don't feel it, then the worship team was weak. It's all about what they must do for me, not I come and say, God, I want to know you. And you know what? Often, that's the only time we we having this experience. We don't have it outside of a, of a gathering or a worship meeting. But what we need to do as Christ followers, we need to examine our contemporary culture so that we can respond appropriately. Paul lived in a world where Christianity wasn't popular. We're living in that world right now. It's not popular. It's not mainstream. Christianity was the minority religion. And so we need to watch when we think of those 
three idols I've mentioned, are we caught up in it without even knowing it? Do we accept things that is happening in our world, but actually God is not pleased with at all? Do we offer a gospel alternative? And so we find Paul in this wonderful city of Athens, and he is distressed. But he's on a mission because it's every day that he lives this life. And he now looks at them and says, hey, this is what's going on. How can I connect with these people and point them to Jesus? So Paul connected with them. He engages with the religious in the synagogue. He engages with people in the marketplace. And he spoke to anyone. Anyone who would listen. He spoke about this. In verse 17, he says, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles. And he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. We have to work on our engagement. Actually, we must allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. So that we can actually work on our engagement and engaging with others. Note, Paul doesn't start a riot. He doesn't come with a big stick or a hammer, sledgehammer, and knock down all of those idols and saying, this is wrong, this is not right. His whole attitude is totally different to what we often see happening, especially from evangelical preaching uh, style. What does he do? He realizes these people don't know the God that he knows. And so he starts a conversation. He walks across the room. We've done a series like that called Just a Walk Across the Room. He notices what people are thinking, what they are feeling, what they are worshipping. And here's my question. Are you noticing that too? Or are you just self-consumed about what's all going on in your life? You know, your friends, they're not going to attend the sun who don't know Jesus. They're not going to attend the Sunday meeting. So it's up to you to share with them what you know. We've got to learn the conversational skills. I, I use what are known as the five F words. Yeah, yeah, no, no, not that F word, the good F words. I speak to people about food, about friends, um, about fun, what they do for fun, about their family, about the future. Those five things may lead me to even speak to them about faith. And so I need to engage. I need to know what are people watching on Netflix? What is the Squid Games? You know anything about it? Who are the poets of our days? The songwriters? What are the songs that people are listening to today? Find that point of contact. I love it when people in our church contact me and they're asking my guidance on some information because they are engaging with someone and they've been asked a question and they don't know how to actually answer it. And so we have this discussion. And for me, that excites me. Because they are engaging. They're not scared to say, oh, I don't know the answer. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll speak to my pastor about it. Maybe I, I need to find out a little bit more about that. That's a really great question. You see, you are out there in the world. I, as a pastor, I engage with Christians most of the time. I have to be really work really hard to connect with people who don't know Jesus. And I love doing that. So you have to engage with culture. In your various networks, in clubs that you're part of, in the arts, in, in business, at your place of work, in the neighborhood, at the schools that your children attend. Just like it was at that time when Paul was speaking, today we have many people who are biblically illiterate. Because Christianity is no longer the center of the culture. Most adults in our world, and even in our country, don't attend a Sunday meeting and gather with other Christians. And if they're not gathering, what's happening to their children? 
They're not in a church community at all. And by the way, if you miss a gathering, I hope that wherever you are, you're engaging with someone who's not at the gathering as well. They're outside there. They don't know Jesus. And, and, and you're engaging with them. But as we engage, we must engage boldly, humbly, and intelligently. You see, the early church, they were taught the gospel. They were taught by the apostles. We find Paul being taught by Barnabas. And, and so we also need to read the gospel. We need to see how Jesus engaged with others. What are questions, great questions that Jesus asked people? He asked questions and he listened. We need to ask questions and listen. And sometimes we shouldn't even give an answer. Sometimes we should wait for them to ask us what is our opinion. Sometimes asking the question is almost like putting a, a stone in someone's shoe. It's going to irritate them. It's going to, it's going to stay and remind them. And, and, and maybe they'll come back to you and say, you know that question you asked me, I've been thinking about it. Can we talk a little bit more about it? As we do that, we also do that praying and asking the Holy Spirit to use our conversation and to start to work in the hearts of those who are listening. But here's an amazing thing about Paul. As he's engaging, he's got one thing on his mind. Paul preached Jesus and the resurrection. He doesn't preach condemnation. He wants to introduce them to Jesus. He doesn't want to introduce them to a set of rules and a set of laws. That's why in the, in the synagogues and when he's speaking to the Jews, they want to attack him and beat him up. It's because he's saying, hey, it's not about following laws. There's this wonderful thing that has happened. Jesus has come to die in your place. You no longer have to offer up sacrifices. Jesus came to sacrifice himself so that your sins can be wiped out. And you can find forgiveness by having faith in him. Jesus died for you, but he also rose again. That's the great news of the gospel. And, and Paul wants to introduce them to this wonderful God who made it possible so that our sins can be forgiven. Why does Paul want to do this? Because he doesn't want people to worship idols. He wants people to worship Jesus. He wants them to meet the living God, the God who loved them so much that he died on a cross for them. You see, Jesus alone is worthy of our worship. All other idols will never fulfill us. So we worship him and we call to, to get every tribe and every tongue and every person on this world to, to point them to Jesus so they would worship him. As the resurrected Savior, as the King of Kings, as the Lord of Lords. And so Paul preaches the resurrection. In verse 18 it says, He also had a debate with some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. And when they told him about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, What's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he picked up? Others said, He seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. They're interested in what he has to say because they're always interested in something new. And so they take him to Mars Hill. I had the opportunity to stand on Mars Hill and I did a kind of a pose of me preaching as Paul did. They give him the opportunity to speak. And he starts off in verse 23. He points out that they have an altar to an unknown God. You see, these guys were trying to cover all their bases. So just in case the other gods mess up and they don't provide what they're looking for, you know, perhaps this unnamed God will help them. He was the just-in-case God. Can I say that we can often live our lives like that? 
We can be worshipping so many other things. Our focus and our priorities can be on so many other things. And we've got God just in case. He is not the sole point of our worship. Is God just in case for you? Or is He your everything? You see, these Athenian philosophers worship the idol of sharp intellect. That's what Jenny Williams says. They wanted to engage God as a concept, but they, they didn't see him as the God-man who laid claim on their lives through his death and his resurrection. And so Paul introduces them to God. In verse 30, it says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, and now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul is preaching about Jesus. He's preaching about a gospel of love, about the cross, about judgment and God's amazing grace. And that's so true of Paul's passion. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 2 in the New King James Version, he says, Paul writes, he says, For I determined to know nothing, know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And so Paul preaches. And in conclusion, I want to look at the response. Because we will get similar responses in our world today. In verse 32 it says, And now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, We will hear you again about this. And so Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysus, the Aropagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. We will get those same responses. Some of us may be in that space right now. We have heard the gospel and we may be in one of three spaces. Maybe we're mocking. <laughs> Some will mock. But if you're a Christ follower, remember they're not mocking you. They're mocking Jesus. And Jesus said he will be mocked. You will be mocked because of my name. Others said, hey, you know, we want to hear some more. Let's have a coffee. I'm not yet convinced. Uh, I need to consider it a bit more. But let's meet again and let's talk about it again. That's wonderful. Make sure that you're available to do that. Others said, we believe. And they joined and became part of the family of God. They joined with Paul in saying, we want to know how we can tell others about this good news. So as you have listened this morning, I pray that you would have a longing to worship Jesus. You would have a longing to see others come to faith and worship Jesus. Jesus. I want you to pray and ask God for courage and for an increased commitment to engage with those who need to hear how awesome and how wonderful Jesus is. How God really loves them. And that He alone is worthy to be worshipped. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you again for your word. And I pray, Lord, that even as we've listened this morning, that we be aware if, our, if there are any idols in our lives that is, has taken a superior place and not you. We ask you to forgive us and we come now and we place you on your throne and say, Lord Jesus, you are worthy of all of our worship. Come and fulfill me like you have promised. Maybe some of you are feeling empty this morning. I pray that you would ask the Holy Spirit to fill you up with what you need right now maybe you have come to a point in your life where you've listened to the gospel may you say this morning jesus i believe i want to put my faith and my trust in you and so i pray god help us and equip us give us courage give us boldness help us to to be humble help us to be loving as we reach out and engage with our needy world Thank you that you've promised to be with us 
and to give us the words to say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this morning. Uh, please go to have a read through that whole chapter 17 again, just to refresh yourself. It's an amazing passage of scripture. But if God has spoken you to, to you today and you'd really want to make contact with me, please email me, wesley at urbanvoice.org. And God said, I'd love to help you with any question that you may have, or if you've taken a step of faith, to be able to help you to take those next steps. Next week, you can join me as we look at another aspect of being um, and a, a dangerous church, and that ha is having dangerous obedience. God bless you and have a fantastic day further.